Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's Clean Energy Speaker Series. Uh, I'm Ben Hill with ATDC at Georgia Tech, and thank you so much for being here and braving this inclement weather. Uh, we're glad to see you here and like to welcome all of those of you participating over the web. Uh, I think there are quite a few of you out in webcast land, so, so welcome to today's program. I'd like to make a few announcements and uh, then move into the to our great program for today. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize the sponsors who make this series possible. Uh, thanks goes to Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan, all from Sutherland, who uh, has been a, an ongoing sponsor of the Georgia Tech Clean Energy Speaker Series. The ATDC at Georgia Tech has been a sponsor, uh, South Face Institute, and McKinsey and Company. So we really appreciate their uh, support in making this series possible. Also, I'd like to thank the Southern States Energy Board for their uh, support and assistance in making today's program possible. Uh, should you be participating over the web and have questions for our speakers, just a logistic issue, send, uh, your, send your question as an email to benhill at gotech.edu and I will pass that along to our speakers today. Uh, that email address again is ben.hill at g-a-t-e-c-h dot edu, ben.hill at gotech.edu. Um, just a note about the next program, we're looking at carbon management strategies on Wednesday, November the 17th, which is the Wednesday before the week of Thanksgiving. It'll be at the same time, 12 to 1.30. I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Warren, who will introduce our speakers, and then uh, the format for today's program will also include David Scholes serving, who is a Georgia Research Alliance uh, Scholar in Sustainable Energy, serving as the moderator for the Q&A session. So, Tom. Thank you, Ben. Um, on behalf of Sutherland, we're very happy to, uh, to sponsor the, um, the speaker series. Um, Sutherland is a national law firm. We have a very large uh, energy practice. Uh, we practice in all areas of the energy industry. Um, and in particular in the renewable energy area and in uh, climate change. Um, we've been a part of this uh, program from the beginning and uh, it's been an excellent program and uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, letting us participate. Um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Um, first speaker is Gary Brinkworth. Uh, Gary is a senior uh, manager for new generation and portfolio optimization at uh, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, he has over 28 years of utility industry experience in generation and transmission planning, forecasting, demand side management, evaluation, and rate analysis. He has a BS and MS in electrical engineering from Auburn University and is a registered professional engineer in four states. Um, <clears throat> He's uh, had several positions in his career, um, including um, uh, starting at Southern Company, uh, moving to a uh, Florida municipal utility, and then joining TVA in March 2009, where he oversees the development of long-term capacity plans, including the current integrated resource plan. Uh, <clears throat> and his experience includes work with several regional and national utility industry groups, including CERC, FRCC, and NERC. Our next speaker will be uh, Jerry Hill. Um, he is a senior technical advisor to the Southern States Energy Board. Um, Dr. Hill has over 30 years experience in the petroleum and electric utility industries as a doctorate in civil engineering from the University of Iowa. He coordinates the technical aspects of climate change projects for the Southern States Energy Board. In 2003, SSEB entered into a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy to lead the Southeastern Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership. The partnership is currently conducting uh, four Phase II small-scale CO2 injection experiments and has initiated activities for two Phase III large-scale CO2 injection experiments. We look very much forward to hearing your remarks today. Uh, with that, uh, Gary Brinkworth.
Thank you so much. And uh, as Ben's trying to find my presentation here, just on behalf of TVA, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk at this series today. Uh, we don't serve, of course, any customers here in Georgia, but we'd like to. Uh, so let me know after the presentation, uh, and maybe we can talk. Um, actually, TVA uh, serves a little bit of, uh, of North Georgia, uh, along with, uh, of course, six other states. We are the largest uh, public uh, power utility in the United States. So, uh, but we appreciate the opportunity, uh, and I do particularly, of being here today. You know, Ben talked about the weather. Uh, we actually like this kind of weather at TVA. We call this hydro refueling. Uh, for those of us who have conventional hydro like we do. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the integrated resource plan uh, that we just recently completed at TVA, talk about some of our findings, uh, discuss a little bit of the way that we've evaluated uh, our resource options, and kind of talk about the direction that TVA is trying to set uh, as it relates to this uh, integrated resource plan. So I'm going to start with kind of a basic uh, background slide here. Uh, what is IRP? You're going to hear me use that lingo a lot, so I apologize. You know, uh, system planners, we use a lot of lingo. So uh, an IRP is a, is a way of looking at a resource mix. Uh, it's a traditional utility tool used to balance uh, what are called supply and demand side options in a, in a kind of a fair way uh, to identify the best overall resource plan for uh, the particular utility. Uh, the important things about an IRP is we try and balance all the stakeholder objectives. So the outcome of the IRP is uh, a balanced portfolio that tries to address not only the needs of the electric utility, uh, but the needs of the various stakeholders that we serve. Uh, the idea is to be flexible, uh, to provide a lot of diversity, but to maintain some of our core objectives, and for TVA, those core objectives include things like reliability and low-cost power. So we try and pull all that stuff together in this IRP process. This slide is really busy. I'm not going to go through all this. This slide shows you what, in the IRP team, we call the circle of life, because we've kind of been in this what feels like our whole life. Uh, as a process of trying to approach this analysis. What I do want to do, though, is step you through the six chevrons you see at the bottom of this slide. Gives you some idea about how we go about doing this analysis. We started a little over a year ago with some scoping sessions. Uh, moved from there uh, to development of our, our inputs and things. A lot of this done with the help of some of our stakeholders. We have a lot of public involvement in our IRP process. We've done a lot of modeling work. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute to analyze and evaluate various options. We're now basically in phase four of this process where we're out, uh, basically uh, we're socializing our results. We have a draft IRP that is on the street for public comment. You can find it on our website. Uh, as a federal agency, we have to put this out in draft form for comment along with the associated environmental impact statement. Once that comment period is done, then we'll enter this phase five you see here called incorporating the input where we'll take all that feedback, try and finalize our analysis, and then identify some kind of preferred plan that our board can adopt uh, in around April of next year. The heart of the IRP for TVA is something called scenario planning. Uh, again, this is kind of a busy slide, but the idea here is to talk about what scenario planning is. Uh, as opposed to maybe sensitivity analysis and things like that that are traditionally done for resource planning studies. Scenario planning is about not trying to predict the future, but about trying to look at multiple snapshots of the future and trying to determine the best course of action for the electric utility to be successful in as many of those alternative futures as possible. Okay, so all those plausible futures in the IRP work that we've been doing are called scenarios. And you can see in this matrix, they're actually shown as columns in this matrix. Scenarios are really about things that TVA as a utility cannot control. So greenhouse gas requirements, for example, legislative initiatives, the change in our load shapes and how our customers use our product, financing and construction costs, uh, commodity prices, the changes in steel and gas and coal, those kind of things we can't control, but we have to be able to react to them. So the scenarios are about taking different views of where we think those key drivers for our business might be going, and then trying to analyze our uh, power supply plans in the framework of each one of those 
alternative futures. So in the IRP process that we just completed, we developed six different views of the future in addition to the planning process that we're using currently at TVA. So we have a total of seven ways of looking at the future. And then we looked at five different business plans that TVA might pursue. Those are called planning strategies. Now, the difference between a strategy and a scenario, strategies are made up of things that we can control, like our choice of do we build more nuclear power and if we do, when? How much renewable are we going to add to our portfolio? When do we step up to additional efficiency and conservation? These are all kind of business decisions that TVA can make. So we've looked at five different ways that we might do our business in the future. So the crux of the IRP then is to test those five different ways of doing business in those seven different views of the future. See if one of those five ways performs the best in Ideally, we'd like it to perform the best in all seven of those futures. The reality is it's not going to happen. So we're looking for the way in which we can be most successful in most of those alternatives. We're going to talk in a minute about how we weight those results, come up with something that people can discuss with us, because that's really part of the IRP is to publicly debate the direction that TVA is going to go. So scenarios and planning strategies kind of come together uh, when you uh, look at the intersection here in this matrix, and that's the reason the matrix is in this slide, is each one of those boxes represents a 20-year power supply case that we then have to go and analyze. So the fundamental starting place for that analysis is 35 different 20-year plans for meeting our requirements uh, over that horizon period, which is about 20 years. Not going to read all of the material on this slide, but this summary of planning scenarios that we used uh, gives you some idea about how broad our evaluation is. So we go all the way from the first one you see there, which is a very uh, robust economic recovery scenario. In fact, this assumes continuous uh, growth in our load and our customer demand throughout the 20-year period. So it represents the most challenging environment that TVA would have to operate in in terms of resource requirements. Uh, you go through a couple of other here that are kind of mid-level uh, growth scenarios. We do have a couple here, scenario three and scenario six actually represent either zero or slightly negative growth scenarios. So we've tried to bound our analysis between very robust economics and very stagnant economics, and we have some scenarios that fall in between there. Now, the range of our resource requirements between the lowest of these scenarios, which actually turns out to be scenario six, and the highest one in scenario one, that variation is about 20,000 megawatts by the time we get to the end of our planning period. So now for reference, TVA's current power supply portfolio is about 35,000 megawatts. So we're looking at a range that's fairly large for uh, a utility our size, and what we think that does is lead us to some very robust kind of answers. So that's the idea in scenario analysis, is to get a big range of analytics uh, so that you can look at lots of possible futures. This slide is the same kind of thing for the planning strategies. Again, we looked at five different strategies. They range from, we're not going to change anything about our current fleet. Uh, we're going to ensure that it uh, meets all regulations, but we're not going to retire anything. Uh, and we're also not going to build anything beyond uh, one nuclear unit that we currently have in development. So we're going to rely fully on the marketplace to serve all our load. This is a strategy TVA used several years ago. So this represents kind of one end of the envelope of business plans. And as you look down through here, you'll see that we have various other combinations of whether we include nuclear in our expansion, how much uh, renewable and energy conservation uh, resources we want to count on, uh, and also how much of our coal fleet we're willing to lay up or idle. Uh, TVA recently announced that we're going to do uh, 1,000 megawatts of coal layups here in the next year uh, with uh, the intention of looking at more than this. You'll see if you look at these strategies, the IRP is actually looking at significantly more than this. One of our strategies has 7,000 megawatts uh, of coal that would be uh, placed in standby status. Uh, again, for reference, our current coal fleet's about 14,000 megawatts. So this represents about half of our current coal fleet. So it's a pretty aggressive strategy for layups. 
Uh, and you can also see that we have different layers of energy efficiency, different layers of renewables that go into these business plans. So again, the idea is to test those business plans across all of those scenarios. We do that with some pretty extensive modeling work. Uh, this audience probably has a higher geek quotient than I'm used to talking to, so we could probably talk some more about modeling if we really wanted to. But the simple idea here is we're going to take a lot of, uh, of our key assumptions, a lot of those driver variables about load forecasts and fuel and commodities and CO2 compliance and all of those things that drive our decisions as an electric utility, jam them into a capacity planning model that does optimized least cost planning. So what this model will do is look at our requirements for new resources over the planning period in each of those seven futures. And then it's going to optimize a combination of new resources based on the performance characteristics of those new resources, their costs, and what our needs are in each one of those scenarios. So what we get is a set of optimized cases. Then we carry those into a stochastic-based uh, program that varies the assumptions, the driving assumptions, because one of the things we know as planners is we're always wrong. We just don't know how wrong we are for sure. So one of the things we do is we test all those assumptions for what is our customer load, what is the cost of natural gas going to be, how much is it going to cost me to finance this project. We test all of those variables with a distribution. So we run stochastically using a stratified Monte Carlo method uh, that tests the uncertainty around all those driver variables. So we end up with, as you see on this slide, about 2,500 cases uh, that were actually run and modeled and analyzed by our team to come up with some of the information that you're going to see here in a slide or two. So after we've done all that work, where does that bring us? Well, it brings us to some, sort of some key findings that have been part of what we've discussed with our stakeholders around the valley during the last month or so. And I'm just going to run down this list kind of quickly for you. First of all, we found that nuclear is going to continue to play a role in TVA's future. Uh, in fact, most of our planning scenarios uh, and strategies show that nuclear uh, is a preferred resource. In some cases, uh, as many as four different, four new nuclear units might be added to the TVA system over that 20-year period. Again, depends on the future that we're looking at. Fossil layups are also going to be a key part of our analysis. Our cases so far have shown that TVA does, in fact, need to lay up some coal. And it's looking like the IRP is suggesting that number is somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 megawatts. We're going to replace that capacity in part with additional energy efficiency and demand response. That's what this EE and DR thing is that you see on this slide. Um, TVA has some programs in place right now, but the IRP is saying that we need to do a lot more than we're doing. So uh, our results tend to indicate that more of that is actually better for the system in terms of diversity and cost and performance. So we're going to see a lot more push into energy conservation. We're also going to see a lot more push into renewables than uh, where TVA has been. Some of you may know TVA is kind of pioneering some of this purchase of wind through firm power transactions with uh, suppliers out in the Midwest. We have now roughly 1,500 megawatts uh, of wind power that's under contract for delivery to TVA. But our analysis says we need more than that and we need a diverse package of renewables. So uh, in the IRP, we've looked at not only this wind, but at biomass and solar and even some additional conventional hydro uh, to give us uh, part of that diversity uh, and bring some uh, more cost performance uh, uh, aspects to our plan. Uh, we're also going to expand with natural gas. We see that there's obviously a place for natural gas. TVA's portfolio right now uh, is a little bit short on natural gas. If you want to just think about it in terms of, uh, of being a balanced portfolio, we have obviously a lot of coal. We do have some gas. We see that more gas-fired generation is good, but not more coal-fired generation. Uh, we're seeing uh, our analysis tending to indicate that only in one or two of the futures would TVA add any new coal-fired power uh, to its base? Now, we do suggest that we're going to retain the fleet that we have, and you'll see here in a minute we'll talk about how much of that fleet we're going to keep. Uh, but there's only one or two scenarios in which we'd add any new coal, and if we do that, it would be, it seems to be, the model recommending advanced coal technologies like IGCC uh, or maybe some of the new, uh, uh, some of the new 
uh, conventional coal plants uh, like the ultra supercritical coal plants and things like that. Uh, but the model in every case assumes uh, that we'd have to uh, include carbon capture and sequestration uh, on our projects. Uh, and so those costs are included in this analysis. That's part of the reason that the model tends to defer those coal investments in uh, favor of things like natural gas because of the uncertainty around uh, carbon legislation and the cost of carbon capture. But the good news for our customers is our environmental profile, our signature, particularly related to CO2, is going to be significantly lower than it's been historically. In fact, all of our cases show a declining uh, profile in terms of CO2, and you're going to see that here in another uh, slide or two. So how do we go about communicating this very complicated stuff, these 2,500 cases, all this run analysis, in a way that uh, stakeholders who are not professional system planners, who don't have a very high geek factor, uh, can actually discuss this with us? More importantly, how do we do this in a way that allows our board to weigh in and discuss with us what they think our direction is? Well, we do this through a scorecard. And that's what you see on this slide. The scorecard is designed with two halves. It has a ranking half and a strategic half. The ranking half has metrics in it that are very common in the electric business uh, as a way to evaluate plan results. Uh, they're mostly around plan cost. You see there's a, there's a short-term rate impact thing here. There's also a couple of risk factors. All of this relates to the financial performance of these plans. So what we do is we use the left-hand side of this scorecard to basically evaluate how these five planning strategies stack up against each other. Then we bring in the right-hand side of the card because TVA as a federal agency has other obligations beyond power supply. Uh, and part of our mission in the TVA Act involved environmental stewardship and the stimulation of economic development in the valley. So the other side of the scorecard tries to bring in these other strategic goals that we have as an agency uh, and tries to rank these strategies based on how well do they perform against our environmental stewardship obligations and do they set us up to continue to stimulate economic development in the valley. So these two halves of this scorecard kind of come together to help us have a debate about what planning strategy is the best for TVA long term and how we measure that, how do we define what best means. And so that brings us to this really cool slide which I can, I, it's very, very busy. It's got lots of colors and numbers. This, the geek quotient on this slide is really high, okay? But we're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about the details, but they want to tell you what you're looking at um, because this is actually the vehicle we've been using to communicate our results around the valley. So what you see here is uh, for the top three of our planning strategies, you see the fully completed scorecard. So what you see on the left is that ranking scorecard that has the financial metrics basically, the cost and risk performance metrics for each of these three strategies. And again, you can see if you look real closely, there are uh, seven rows in this scorecard, one row for each of the possible futures we tested. So that's why the scorecard looks the way it does. And then we actually built a scorecard for each of the five strategies, but two of them were eliminated in this draft phase because their performance metrics were very poor. These three are the ones that we kept. What you're seeing here is a score that's assigned through our modeling techniques for each of these metrics, for plan costs and rates, uh, and then the two measures of risk. And then you also see colors, at least on the left-hand side of the scorecard. Those colors help us differentiate the, the best performing plans from those who don't perform so well. The colors are actually assigned using an algorithm, and again, this is me as a bureaucrat. I didn't know this could happen, but Excel actually does this for us. Okay, so there's a formula in Excel. I think that's like way cool. Uh, uh, that uh, takes our number score and assigns the correctly graduated color to that. So the best performing plan gets a green color. The worst performing plan in each future it gets red, and then Excel figures out what that color needs to be in between based on the relationship of the scores. 
So when you look at these scorecards, you can see that there's green, there's also yellow, there's some orange. That actually tells you how they relate to one another. So obviously the scorecard at the top, at least on the left-hand side, has the most green. It performs the best, that particular planning strategy, in the most number of pl plausible futures. Okay? So that's kind of how you read the left-hand side. The right-hand side has our strategic considerations in it. So what you see on the right-hand side is a slightly different way of representing this. In the environmental stewardship area, what we elected to use is a method called Harvey Balls, which I'm not making that up. It really is called Harvey Balls. Uh, I, I call them consumer reports things. That's what you see in consumer reports, okay? Uh, and the idea here in Harvey Balls is the more colored in that ball is, the better it is. So what you're looking for in an ideal world, Fairy Godmother was part of this analysis, it would be all black, okay? All the balls will be black. That'd be perfect. So when you look on the right-hand side now, even though on the left-hand side you had a very strong strategy at the top, when you look on the right-hand side and you say, okay, if I'm looking at my environmental stewardship characteristics, well, that strategy on the top that did so well on the left-hand side is kind of middle of the road on the right-hand side. And the strategy that's number two actually performs better uh, in terms of meeting our environmental stewardship obligations. The far right-hand columns, of course, have the environmental impact, I'm sorry, the economic impact in them, and those are represented as a percent change from our baseline. And if you could see those numbers, which I realize you probably can't, uh, you would see that they're fairly small percent differences. So what we found is really any one of these planning strategies is about equal in terms of whether it stimulates, continues to stimulate uh, economic development in the valley. So this scorecard is then what we use to discuss this situation with our various constituencies. And what you can see if you look here is depending on how you value certain metrics, you could make one choice or another. For example, if you were very, very interested in cost and risk performance, you might argue that planning strategy C is the one that you want to adopt. But if you're concerned about balancing that with environmental stewardship, then maybe you want to say, well, but actually, maybe planning strategy E is the one that we want. And so the good news is we haven't decided yet. And that's part of the reason that we're out talking to our stakeholders in this draft phase is to get that kind of feedback. There's more to our analysis, though, than just that scorecard, as cool as that was. Uh, TVA has a couple of other obligations. One of those is for technology innovation. So one of the things that we did in the IRP was said, okay, what kind of technologies do we have to stimulate in order to achieve all the benefit that we've assumed in these planning cases? And we arrived at these five uh, technologies that we are going to need to encourage or invest in as we move forward in order to make sure that we get all of the value that we think we can from our futures. And the way to look at this table is we've got the innovation and a short description of it, and then these columns A through E relate to the, the planning strategies. So if you look at that first row, for example, smart grid technology, what we're saying is any of our planning strategies that identify a larger block of efficiency and conservation, those strategies are going to need smart grid technology to fully implement all of those efficiency programs and gain all the benefits. So you see all those X's over there, and that's the way to look at this table. So you see we also recognize transmission design and infrastructure needs that have to do with moving not only that renewable power from the Midwest, but also improving the reliability of the system that we have inside the valley. Advanced energy storage, we definitely have an interest in pumped hydro. As you may know, we have a large pumped hydro system uh, or project already on the system. We're looking at adding to that. That's extremely important for us, especially when we take on more and more renewable power that is not dispatchable, that tends to operate in off-peak hours. We need a way to kind of store that benefit. That's what pumped hydro allows us to do. We have small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, TVA wants to continue to be a leader in nuclear technology and in the implementation of nuclear technology, and so we're looking at these smaller nuclear plants. They come sort of in, the nuclear guys tell me they come in a four-pack, uh, which kind of makes it sound like something you'd get in the grocery store, you know. Uh, uh, they're much smaller than, uh, than current nuclear uh, design. They're in the neighborhood of like 250 megawatts, so you could like drop one in your backyard if you wanted to, you know. Um, and then the last thing here about, uh, about emissions technology, uh, I said before that our plans don't show that we're adding a lot of new coal, but our plans do show that we're going to maintain uh, a fair amount of our coal fleet 
uh, somewhere probably between eight to 9,000 megawatts of our coal fleet is going to be maintained over this study period. And so we're very interested in ensuring that we have the best technology available to control the emissions and the other kind of performance characteristics that come out of those coal units. There are other areas of risk in any planning study. You know that you've got some things that you just haven't been able to quantify. You can't monetize everything. That's really what this slide is about is there's still some uncertainty that our board is going to have to deal with as they begin to make this decision. Things like how do we actually ensure full deployment of our energy efficiency and demand response programs. As you may know, TVA, of course, is a wholesale supplier to about 156 distributors in the Tennessee Valley. We don't actually touch customers directly except through a handful of large industrial accounts. And so one of the things that's important for us to deploy these programs, especially things that happen on the customer side of the meter, is to make sure that our distributors are fully on board with what we're doing. They are, have been great partners for us over the years, but this is a key area of uncertainty about whether or not will Knoxville promote things the same way Memphis will promote them, the same way as Scottsboro will promote them, the same as Bristol, Tennessee will promote them. That's part of our uncertainty, and we have to find a way to analyze that as we move into this last phase of the IRP. Natural gas deliverability and availability is another uncertainty. Lots of folks are dealing with that around the country. Uh, project development uncertainty is another problem for us at TVA. Of course, especially large projects like nuclear plants and other things like that have some uncertainty about licensing permitting and construction. Some of that uncertainty we have already captured in our cost variation and in our stochastic analysis, but some of it we haven't. Uh, and lastly, the, the last thing here is about transmission infrastructure. Again, as I mentioned, uh, to get full effectiveness out of this wind power that we're getting from the Midwest, we have to ensure that there's adequate transmission, not only inside our system, but between us and the source of the wind power. Uh, and that's a challenge, obviously, for TVA because we have to work with other utilities who may or may not be interested in helping us attain, uh, attain our goals. So. so how do we know that we've got a diverse enough mix? Well, if you see on this slide, I've got two ways of looking at the breadth of the analysis from the top three planning strategies that we've retained. The table on the left shows the variation in megawatts that have been considered in these plans in terms of how much capacity could be added and just again for reference, we have a column here about our existing system. So you see that we're looking at a fairly wide range of things that could be added. All of our conventional technologies go from we could add none of it to we could add quite a bit of it with the exception of IGCC. You see there we're only showing a small amount of variation for that particular coal technology. But everything else shows a pretty wide bandwidth uh, of possible combinations of resources. And that bodes well for our analysis because it means we've got a robust set of planning strategies from which our board can choose. The right-hand side shows you the same sort of information but on an energy mix kind of basis. The pie at the top is our current energy mix. The pie at the bottom is representative of the analysis that we've done in this, in this IRP for a mix that is in year 2025. One of the things that you'll notice right away there is that the pie wedges are, uh, are different in terms of coal and nuclear. You see that coal uh, performs at, at a lower level than what we got right now. Coal is about 50%, 51% of our energy mix right now. It's going to be probably about 35% uh, of our mix in the future. Uh, nuclear is going to pick up a bigger piece of that along with efficiency and renewables and other things. So again, we're moving in the direction of a more diversified and a cleaner portfolio. And that's what you see in this slide right here is our profile. Uh, and we use CO2 in the IRP as kind of a proxy for all our air emissions because they all kind of follow the same pattern. So what you see here is two things about CO2 plotted on the same graph, CO2 intensity and tons of CO2 emitted. So what's happening is when you look at the bar charts, those are uh, the CO2 tons emitted. And what you'll see is between the highest and lowest ranges, and we have a mid-range plotted here, you'll see that CO2 emissions do go up in some of these scenarios, obviously, because we're serving more load. So the total tons go up. But in all cases, the intensity goes down. So our mix is getting cleaner, even though we're emitting more tons. So now TVA is trying to balance those two make sure that we maintain our environmental stewardship, but do it in a responsible and a cost-effective way. The TVA board just issued a new uh, mission statement back in August uh, talking about where TVA is going to go in the future. 
uh, and the IRP uh, aligns really well with that vision. In fact, a lot of the analysis that we did in the IRP helped shape these vision statements. So you see the, the three parts of our vision right here. We're going to uh, strive to lead the nation in improving our air quality. So we're going to do that through a number of things. Uh, again, these keys for technology control on emissions of existing fossil fleet, but also about laying up between two and 5,000 megawatts uh, of our current fossil generation, replacing that with renewables and energy efficiency and conservation, and a little bit of gas-fired generation. We have a, a goal here to lead the nation in increasing our nuclear production. We're going to do that through this commitment to small modular reactors and also to continuing to look at large full-size power stations for nuclear expansion. As you probably know, we have a project potentially on the books uh, at our Watts Bar. And not only the one we're finishing at Watts Bar, but at Bellefonte in North Alabama. Uh, we have a, a project there that, that still shows very, very attractive economics in terms of things we might develop. The last one here is our goal to be the Southeast leader in energy efficiency and conservation. And we're going to do that again through this commitment to uh, significantly step up our efforts in those areas. The IRP supports that because a number of our cases show uh, that we need to add more uh, of that particular resource. So where are we on this IRP? Well, this is kind of that same uh, chevrons you saw at the beginning. But just to reinforce where we are right now is that we're out shopping these draft results uh, as part of our process. Again, like I said, as a federal agency, we have to be out talking to our public about our results. Once we get those results back, we will refresh our analysis, convert that report into a final version along with its associated environmental impact statement, resubmit those to the EPA probably in early March so that our board can meet uh, when they meet in April, I should say, they can make a decision about what planning strategy TVA would adopt. Uh, and then that planning strategy then guides our, uh, our annual planning processes and all of our project analysis then uh, going forward in the future. We do have a lot of information on our website. Um, again, uh, probably a lot more technical interest in this group than normal. So you find a lot of technical stuff on this website. I usually tell our stakeholders that if they're insomniacs, they need something to look at, go to this website because there's just like a bunch of stuff here uh, that would put you to sleep in a heartbeat. Uh, but we're real proud of all the stuff that's posted out there. All of our uh, analysis and presentations to our stakeholders are there along with a lot of our other uh, backup data. Uh, my contact information is here on the slide. And then our project manager for the IRP, Randy Johnson, his contact information is at the bottom of that slide. So if you have more general questions, you can, uh, you can talk to Randy. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much for having me and look forward to answering questions. Gary, thank you very much for your presentation. Jerry, would you like to uh, talk to us uh, about uh, CCARB and its activities? And uh, maybe while we're setting up, if I could just mention, if, but for those of you um, participating over the web, all the, uh, the presentations are on the website, secleanenergy.org. And for those of you uh, who are looking for archive copies afterwards, all these great presentations are on that website. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Uh, on behalf of Southern States Energy Board, I'd like to express our appreciation for the invitation to speak today. Uh, what I plan to do is uh, talk to you about uh, greenhouse gas uh, capture and the power, primarily the power industry. But I think Gary has provided a nice backdrop in his presentation on how the mix of fuels is changing in the, uh, in the power industry. And uh, I'll, I'll bear out a few of those points as we go forward here. Uh, again, uh, it was pointed out that this is probably a very knowledgeable group, but uh, let's just take a few seconds to talk about what carbon capture and sequestration uh, are. Uh, what we are talking about is capturing the carbon from fossil fuels, primarily at power plants and industrial facilities, to remove, remove these greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. 
Uh, the easiest way to do that is with these point source emissions. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what can be done with the transportation sector, but I think when it comes down to really targeting industries that are going to participate either in a voluntary basis or a mandatory basis, uh, should that come about, um, the point sources uh, seem to be high on everyone's list. We've seen this with uh, not only carbon management, but in the past with uh, various other uh, air pollutants and water pollutants that uh, have been controlled. So when we try to control it, we can store it or sequester it in underground reservoirs. Uh, there are uh, research projects that are ongoing that look at uh, putting dissolved CO2 in deep oceans. Um, you can convert it to a rock-like material, but again, there's a limited market for that type of uh, approach. And then the final way is indirect uh, sequestration using plant biomass, either uh, green biomass or, or carbon soils to uh, sequester CO2 for long periods of time. If we, oh, this got, uh, this is not, okay, <laughs> the slide here, it, it usually goes through a sequence, but uh, it's, it's uh, not doing that. What we want to do, if we look for a suitable geologic location, uh, we want to protect the groundwater. That's a primary, if in the permitting process, the real driver at state level and EPA level is underground injection control or protecting the groundwater. So what you want to do is you want to look for pore space, and that's uh, indicated by the little uh, brown circles there with a CO2 plume in them. You look for that pore space where you can get the CO2 into the rocks or into the formation. But you also want to have a seal above it that's going to keep it there. That's very important. So those are the three things we look for. Protect the, the uh, groundwater resource, and we're protecting that generally down to not only the potable water, but 10,000 parts per million uh, uh, salinity. Look for a formation that's very close to being impermeable, so the CO2 will migrate through that up to the drinking water. And then you look for something that you can get the CO2 into, and it has enough space that it can be stored. Uh, we are, Southern States Energy Board manages a uh, regional carbon sequestration partnership, the Southeast Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership, or CCARB. We are one of seven partnerships uh, that uh, we are working with the Department of Energy uh, on this. And a little map here shows the other uh, organizations. These, if you check these slides later, here are the contacts, not only for our organization, but for the other six. It's a very large program. It's gone through or going through three phases of activity. The first 24-month period uh, covered, phase one covered characterization, looking at uh, geologic formations and terrestrial opportunities in the various parts of the U.S. Phase two is a validation phase, small-scale injection, testing these formations and determining what uh, uh, the likelihood of being able to go uh, to use these for commercial uh, enterprises. And finally, the last step is deployment. I'll get to two deployment projects that we're working on. Uh, these programs, as you can see by the dollar amounts, uh, become large very quickly. The, uh, uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to do this research at a uh, pre-commercial scale, at a deployment scale that tests uh, technology before it goes out uh, uh, for wide deployment. Uh, the Department of Energy, in supporting our activities and other activities, ultimately will come up with several documents that I think you'll find useful if you're tracking this particular CCS uh, activity. Uh, monitoring, verification, accounting is an important part of the process. Uh, they have a document that's available. Uh, you can get this from the DOE website or the National Energy Technology Laboratory, NETL website. And it shows a list of, uh, of uh, documents, that, uh, best practices documents that are out there or will be out there soon. 
What I'd like to do is step from the DOE program into our specific uh, activities. Uh, by, first, by acknowledging U.S. Department of Energy and the National Energy Technology Laboratory, but also acknowledging our cost share and research support uh, partners. So about one-third of our funding is coming from the private sector. Uh, we've got 43 current participants uh, listed here that you might want to uh, look at uh, later on the slides. And in our particular case, uh, I've shown this slide before, so I'll move it through it quickly. We started out and looked at our characterization. From that, we nominated four phase two small-scale injections. We've conducted all four of those. Uh, they uh, are where two were conducted in coal seams and two are in saline tests. And we're moving now into our phase three activity. One of those uh, tests, as we call our early tests, has been ongoing uh, since late 2007. The other will start in uh, that, that is using pipeline CO2 injecting into uh, a water leg or into saline formation near an active oil field. The second is going to be an anthropogenic test where we will actually integrate carbon capture, transportation, injection, and monitoring. The uh, phase two projects uh, are conducted in a wide uh, uh, series of uh, geologic formations within the southeast. Uh, like I said, we've got two coal seam projects, one uh, in near Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in the Black Warrior Basin, the other in Russell County, Virginia. Uh, the Geologic Survey of Alabama at the University of Alabama leads the Tuscaloosa effort. Uh, Virginia Tech has a field lead for the uh, uh, Russell County activity. And there is work being done right now that will be reported out next month on Follow on to that, uh, Virginia Tech is working with a private sector, sector company, Marshall Miller and Associates, to identify an opportunity for large-scale injection into coal seams. The other two projects we're having are geared toward saline formations. Uh, as we think about our opportunities for storing CO2, we have a hierarchy. And we talk about first movers. Uh, first movers, we feel, are going to be enhanced oil recovery. There is a active uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, enterprise in EOR or enhanced oil recovery, primarily in, the, in our region in the uh, Permian Basin in West Texas. Uh, some of that starting very recently in Alabama and Mississippi, expanding into Louisiana and East Texas. Um, that provides an opportunity for what are termed the first movers. There is an economic incentive that helps offset some of the costs of deploying this technology. Ultimately, you move from that to other economic opportunities. We feel the work we're doing with coal seams is going to prove out it's technically feasible. Uh, the jury's still out on economics of using CO2 for enhanced coal bed methane recovery. Ultimately, if this technology is going to be deployed on a large scale, you've got to get to saline formations. You have to get into non-hydrocarbon bearing formations as your target uh, storage uh, reservoir. A uh, few pictures from our field activity in phase two. Uh, we have a very active and large outreach and education program. Uh, we've expanded that recently to what we call C-Carb Ed, where we're actually doing uh, training modules and uh, professional development unit uh, uh, activities for, the, uh, for this sector. Uh, I talked earlier about uh, performing a large-scale injection, planning that for 2011-2012 timeframe in coal seams. Uh, this slide gives you a little bit of information on what we're doing there and who the partners are in that activity. It's a multi-state activity. Uh, we have selected uh, three potential targets. That information is being written up. Those reports will be out uh, about uh, probably in early December. Uh, and then we'll press forward with that work next year. 
what we've learned from the coal seam tests, I want to touch that first and then we'll talk about saline. Uh, storage in deep, thin coal seams is a viable option for the Appalachian region. Uh, there uh, isn't a lot of data available on saline formations, but we feel this one is, is very uh, promising. We found that the CO2 readily absorbs to coal and displaces methane. That's important for two reasons. One is we've got a lot of these thin coal seams in the coal bed methane fields that we can get additional uh, methane uh, recovered from those seams. Uh, but the CO2 adsorbing there provides a storage mechanism. We see the potential in CO2 enhanced coal bed methane recovery being very much akin to where the use of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery was some 30 years ago. Right now, technically feasible, again, as I said, jury's still out in the economics, but as technologies such as directional drilling, going, being able to go down and turn a drill and follow these little uh, one or two foot coal seams, as that technology develops, we think that it will provide opportunities for use of CO2 to recover more methane and to store that as, as an uh, adsorb to the coal. Um, I covered that. And finally, the re, uh, reliable monitoring, measurement, and verification tools have been demonstrated for coal seams. This is a very important part of the public trust. Uh, we're venturing into areas here where there's not a lot of information. We're doing experiments. What we need to do is ensure that the public has confidence in what we're doing. So we have the, the work we're doing with the Department of Energy has uh, placed a lot of emphasis on our MVA, what we call our MVA toolbox, on developing the tools, the protocol, the models that help us understand where the CO2 is migrating to, how it's being held, and we can monitor to ensure safe injection and storage. We verify that it's there and we can account for it uh, for purposes of uh, uh, using, uh, collecting uh, credits, carbon credits. Next thing I'd like to do is move into our saline projects. As I said, we, had, uh, we have two of them in phase three, but we did a project in phase two, our small scale injection at uh, Mississippi Powers Plant Daniel. Uh, we work very closely with the Electric Power Research Institute on this, uh, with Southern Company uh, Research, the research arm of uh, the Mississippi Power's parent, and with a number of other utilities that are members of the uh, Electric Power Research Institute and contribute to their research funds. Uh, what we did at the uh, Plant Daniel plant was we put in an injection well and a uh, uh, monitoring well. And what we were doing there is three or four things. One was to work with the local community and the employees at the power plant to reach out and get them to understand what it is we wanted to accomplish. The second was uh, we, we needed to gain experience on working in a power plant environment. And you can see here, there's a, you, you see the test site here in the front. Uh, these uh, areas are very tight. The, the real estate is at a premium in generally in power plants. And so trying to come in and do a test is a challenge. You'll see later with our integrated program, trying to come in and put up facilities for capturing carbon uh, within an existing power plant footprint is a real challenge. Uh, here's some shots of the activity that uh, occurred at Plant Daniel. We brought in a drilling rig that you would see in an oil field, uh, set up operations, took a lot of core and logged the wells and, and got information on the geology of that injection site. Conducted an injection and then we uh, matched what, our, uh, what we saw in the injection with what we predicted with our mathematical models that, that calculated plume move over time. Uh, again, moving to phase three, we've got two lo locations. The first is a uh, enhanced 
EOR field uh, that is operated by Denbury Resources where we conducted uh, our early tests. And the anthropogenic test, again, we're going to be working with the Electric Power Research Institute, Southern Company Research, this time in Alabama at their uh, uh, Plant Berry. So let's start with the early test. Again, what we've done here is we've taken, we've gone into a field that was uh, developed in the 40s. Uh, it, it was plugged and abandoned in the 60s. The field's been at rest. Denbury Resources is going in now with CO2 that they're piping in from Natchez, uh, or from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson Dome, which is a naturally occurring CO2 source. They're bringing the CO2 in, they're activating this EOR field, and so we've stepped in there to monitor that and work with them. Uh, we were able to get our wells, monitoring wells in and get our activity started uh, prior to their flood, so we got baseline information. And we're doing this in two parts. Uh, one is to uh, watch what was going on with EOR, but the second is to simulate a saline injection. And so what happens here is we were, uh, the G8 has a goal of having 20 large-scale programs by 2020. Well, we hit the mark of a million tons uh, monitor in injection uh, back in October of 2009. We're really the only the fifth project of this scale in the world. So let's look at this site. Uh, Natchez, in, in your uh, frame there to the left, you'll see Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, this field is at about 11,000 feet uh, depth. The field is a typical anticline or what's called a four-way closure in the oil and gas business. If you think about taking a salad bowl and flipping it upside down on your table, those hydrocarbons are migrating up in there. There's a seal. It's keeping them there. So over geologic time, what happens is you created underneath that dome a, uh, a gas uh, formation around a little bit further down below that gas formation is an oil ring. And then as you move down the water leg, as they call it, down the sides of that slope, and this is only a 1% or 2% slope, you get into brackish water, saline water. So this is a type of thing we would want to look at if we're doing saline tests. Uh, a little different perspective, uh, the same formation exaggerated here if we're looking at a 1% or 2% gradient. We started out on the la uh, right in, our, in the oil field as Denbury uh, brought this into production, started its flood, and they injected the CO2 and we monitored that. Now one of the attractive things about this particular flood is that Denbury is injecting CO2 and it's just keeps injecting, keeps injecting, eventually they increase the pressure, the, the oil, water, and CO2 will lift in a production well. It's very different than what's going on in the Permian Basin. In the Permian Basin, they conduct what they call a WAG, water alternating with gas. So it's water, then CO2, then water, and quite often then they'll lift, they'll pump it out, they'll lift it. So we had an opportunity here to have a real good analog of what CO2 going into salt water would look like. We started out CO2 going into this oil ring, but then in phase three, we've moved down dip and we're in that area where there are not hydrocarbons that are, can be economically recovered. And we got Dan. So watch the red, watch what the CO2 does. Whoops, first of all, it's, we're injecting here a buoyant fluent and, and, and it's showing up a little bit toward the bottom of the, uh, the monitoring wells. And jumping ahead, we ended up with what looked like three or four different spots. And as we go back and analyze that, what's happening, what we feel is happening, is this CO2 is following that old riverbed up and around and down. And that's exactly what's going to happen when you start injecting this stuff. So it's, a very, it's going to be very difficult to try to model this. And, and right now the Department of Energy recognizes that and they're putting a lot into computational analysis, trying to build the models that will help us understand how CO2 will move, how big the footprint will be, will it get into my neighbor's property, all these kinds of questions uh, to help 
characterize formations and get ready for this technology in the future. So the final test we're doing is what we call an integrated project. Uh, we're working with the Electric Power Research Institute, Southern Company, and Alabama Power at the Alabama Power Plant Berry. Again, we're going to transport CO2. We're going to take it 12 miles, and Denbury is going to do that. Our partner, again, is Denbury Resources. Now, uh, just quickly, the formation we're looking for is the Paluxy. You see it there uh, toward the bottom. That's a formation that is about 1,100 feet thick at about 9,400 foot in depth, and it's on top of the oil formation, this Rodessa uh, formation that eventually Denbury will go in and use CO2 to recover uh, oil in that formation. Now, before I go much further, I want to talk a little bit about some of the difficulties in trying to do these integrated projects. And one of the biggest difficulties right now is we have no clear signals, either at the federal level or state level in most states, on liability or long-term stewardship. So folks that want to do this are faced with a dilemma right now of, well, I, even doing experiments, I may have some long-term liability. So out of necessity and, 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 and also being very fortunate for us in the southeast, we've had to look toward these enhanced oil recovery fields as places where we could do our experiments. And the reason for that is, in this case, we're going to put the CO2 over an oil boring formation that they'll eventually put CO2 into it. And there are three or four seals above that before we ever reach the groundwater. So the folks that are doing it, number one, plan to put additional CO2 into this landmass, and number two, there's a difference between perceived risk of CO2 storage and the actual risk, and we're grappling with that right now. But the folks that are in the business, the folks that are doing enhanced oil recovery, understand the difference between perceived and real risk, and they're willing to move forward with us. They're willing to uh, be a partner. So that's one of the main reasons this is occurring. Uh, what I've done here, I talked earlier about the modeling. We do a lot of work on modeling. This is a 3D model of all those different sand formations that are located within this 1,100 foot uh, section we looked at. We looked at all the different corings and logs and seismic and identified 17 little individual units within this 1,100 feet. Very complex. All right, the, this particular project that will start up in 2011 is fully integrated. It's a small project uh, using a 25 megawatt slipstream from an existing power plant to capture the CO2. We are focusing in our effort on uh, what's called post-combustion capture separation. Uh, there are two different activities going on. There is an activity with gasifiers to change the nature of the way power is made through gasification and separate the CO2 prior to making the electricity. DOE has a number of programs going on. One of those you may have heard of is uh, FutureGen, now FutureGen 2. There are other companies that are like uh, Duke Power that are investing in new IGCC, integrated gas combined cycle plants. Um, the, the target for those plants is to be able to capture CO2 with about a 10 percent penalty in the cost of electricity. We're focusing on post-combustion, after this, the fossil energy is combusted technologies. And in those technologies, there are really two reasons to do that. One is to have a technology ready for the future fleet, the future coal fleet. More importantly, uh, as we go from a program where we're doing the experiments and doing the research, to a program where there may be voluntary uh, reductions in CO2 to a future, a global future, that may require uh, strict limitations on greenhouse gases and how much carbon can come out of a power plant, it's going to be important to have post-combustion capture technologies available for the existing fleet. Gary talked about their plans, and you may have noted that a big part of their IRP 
is a reduction in coal. And one of the reasons for that, it's a very practical reason, is all the uncertainty around coal right now. But let me tell you, there are a lot of plants out there that have longevity. There are a lot of plants out there that have just installed NOx controls, flue gas desulfurization controls, big dollar investments on in those plants. So we want to keep options available to keep those plants up and operating. The other thing is, as those plants drop off, what's going to take their place? The, the tendency right now, and, and, and Gary pointed this out, there's a big chunk of that uh, capacity that will need to be made up. Uh, some will be renewables, but wind doesn't blow all the time, it doesn't rain all the time, sun doesn't shine all the time. We've got to deal with that. You've got to back them up. So fossil energy or nuclear continues to back up those resources. The other thing is uh, we haven't built nuclear for a while, so there are very ambitious plans for in IRPs throughout uh, the United States to replace a lot of the uh, existing plant with nuclear to reduce the carbon footprint. It may not occur. Uh, so we've got to keep the clean coal option open. And if we look at the numbers, TVA is a good example. They're showing about 50 percent currently of their uh, their energy output is from coal. That's, that follows right across the United States and, and globally. Uh, market share of coal is not going to grow. We don't really see it growing in the U.S. It's probably going to hold its own. But worldwide, we're bringing on maybe half a dozen power, coal-fired power plants in a year's time, if we're lucky. China's bringing on about one a week. So. We need to face the fact that in a carbon-constrained world, it's a world that we're looking at, not just the United States or not just Georgia. And we need to plan for that. So the, 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 the effort we're putting forward here is to look at integrated uh, systems for carbon capture, transportation, storage, and monitoring. And our focus is make those uh, technologies available for the future coal fleet and for existing plant. So we're looking at an existing plant, 25 megawatt slipstream. Uh, this is a unit, uh, the technology is a uh, advanced amine by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, MHI. Uh, they're fabricating off-site, they're going to bring this unit in, uh, and it is sep funded separately. There are no federal dollars in this part. The federal dollars in our work go, go toward getting the CO2 to the injection site and monitoring the injection of the CO2. This is a schematic of a uh, advanced amine scrubber. What happens here is you, you take, uh, what this tells you is you have to get a flue gas and it has to be a pretty clean flue gas so that plants that are capable of being retrofitted right now are the plants that have flue gas desulfurization because you've got to get the sulfur out, it will poison out this system if you don't. So you bring it in, you drop the temperature, you drop the pressure, you, you take it through an absorber column and pick up the CO2. Then you move it over, you hit it with steam, you get the, you release the CO2, you take that away in a separate stream and compress it. Now the CO2 as a gaseous form would have a huge volume, so we take it up to what is called a supercritical fluid. You want to push it through the pipeline as a fluid. We also want to inject that as a fluid. We want to keep that in fluid state. So when we inject, generally we have to inject below about 2,500 feet. That's our target formation, to keep it in that fluid state. It's a very complex system. A uh, 25 megawatt pilot is probably about one-tenth scale of what you'll need for commercial. This is a unit that's north of $100 million just to build the pilot. Here's the groundbreaking at Plant Berry on April 14th. Just show you quickly a few shots. Uh, setting the unit up on site. And I said earlier the unit was barged downstream. Those are huge, I'll back up a second, huge sections. Again, this is about one-tenth scale of a commercial unit. Some of the uh, Alstom, Childamonia, I believe they're talking about a 250 megawatt module. 
Uh, Mitsubishi is talking about about 160 in their next step in their modular form. Very big units. Uh, the picture on the lower right is where the system taps into the existing flue gas desulfurization system. Got to bring a clean gas stream out, separate that, uh, dry it, and then put it in the pipeline. The questions that we're going to address in this integration is what business relationships uh, do we have to establish between the CO2 provider, transporter, and the injection field? And it may not seem that obvious immediately, but we're talking about a new business arrangement where you've got uh, utilities, either merchant plants in the unregulated area, area or investor-owned utilities or municipal utilities having to work with somebody who's going to take that CO2 and put it in a pipeline, pipelines that don't exist today, pipeline infrastructure that's got to be built. They'll hand it off to somebody who's going to use that for enhanced oil recovery or maybe in the future uh, CO2 enhanced coal bed methane recovery. But ultimately, if this is a large business, they're going to have to put it in saline formations. And then a fourth party is going to have to monitor that activity to see how it's going. So there's a lot that has to be learned there. We also have to figure out how the plant affects the injection system and vice versa. They have to work as a unit. And what are the communication systems that need to be set up, human and uh, electronic communication systems to make it all work? And then how do you scale up? So what we found to date uh, is that CO2 enhanced oil recovery provides economic offset for the what we call our first movers. The first people that are going to invest will probably invest collecting anthropogenic CO2 for EOR. Uh, the storage potential in saline formations in the southeast is high as any place in the nation. Um, I already mentioned the business challenge to industry in trying to integrate these systems. And again, here we feel we have a very reliable monitoring measurement verification system that we can use to, uh, to monitor these saline injections. And with that, I would uh, like to take any questions, and I guess we go to a panel format for that. Right. If you and Gary would have seen it, thank you for your presentation. So thank you to both the speakers. I'm David Scholl. I'm a professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering here at Georgia Tech. We welcome questions for either of the speakers. I suggest that you briefly identify yourself and then speak up and we can have a discussion. Yeah, please go ahead. I've got a question for Gary. Uh, Gary, I'm a PhD from Michigan State University Department of Resource Development and my dissertation research was called Nuclear Power Choices and the Future and I wrote it in 1981 and I will brag that I properly forecasted the future of the nuclear power industry in 1981 and here we are today. So my question is with that background and I don't claim any special insight at all. I just read what everybody else writes. My question today is, considering all the issues surrounding nuclear power, waste disposal, reprocessing, weapons proliferation, the terror threat, uh, alien uh, technologies that are maybe more sophisticated for third world nations where nuclear power looked like it was going to be a panacea and then plants were shuttered or closed and didn't head. And now all of a sudden nuclear looks like it's coming to its, into its vogue again. So. My perception is, without any evaluation or, or promoting or, or denigrating the technology, it doesn't appear to me that much has changed in all the factors except that uh, carbon dioxide has become an issue, which wasn't an issue in 1981. That's the only real change that I see, but then again, I'm not working in the space every day. So given that, how predictable is the current climate that seems to be receptive to nuclear power for the future as hundreds of millions of dollars are invested into building more of it? Thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm not a nuclear guy. I just stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So, you know, that's as close as I get to knowing anything about nuclear. Uh, what we've done in our analysis is uh, looked at the things that drive the advantage of nuclear, and I think you hit the nail on the head in part of the question, is our predictions about CO2 compliance regimes and the cost of that compliance 
tend to tip the scales a little bit in favor of nuclear as an apparent cost-effective alternative for utilities to consider. Now, in TVA's case, we have some advantages that, frankly, other utilities in the U.S. don't have, uh, uh, particularly at our Bellefonte site, because we have like a partially completed project. So in terms of economics there, uh, we've got kind of a leg up. Um, however, as we look at other technologies, and as you may know, there are some advanced technologies being developed, one of those here in Georgia. Uh, at Plant Vogel, I believe, is going is to host a new, uh, one of the new uh, uh, AP-1000, they're called, uh, nuclear designs. Uh, we are looking at that, uh, but it does not appear to be as attractive, uh, at least for the near-term solution, again, because of uncertainties about its cost and licensing requirements and things like that. So I think your, your point is a really good one. We are doing our best to get our arms around what those risks are. Our nuclear development folks have commissioned several studies about uh, this cost and uh, schedule uncertainty, uh, tried to bound that information so that uh, our board has as much information as they have to make the decision. But uh, strictly from a planner, it, it's getting driven a lot by the total environment, which includes this CO2 penalty factor. Um, as a follow-up to that, <coughs> Uh, it was either Duke Energy or Duke University recently did a study that found that nuclear power um, had reached cost parity with photovoltaic solar. And while solar is going to keep going down in price, nuclear is going to continue going up. Have you done any similar kind of study and why would you go with the nuclear option as opposed to solar when most of the implications with nuclear are eliminated? Well, yeah. <laughs> That, that's a great set of questions. Uh, let, let me see what I can do about part of those. Uh, we don't see the performance and duty cycle of nuclear and solar being anywhere comparable. Uh, nuclear dispatchability and nuclear round-the-clock production just frankly can't be, uh, can't be mimicked with a solar uh, installation unless you um, couple that with some kind of advanced storage technology and, and it becomes a lot more complex. So we don't consider those to be interchangeable technologies. I, I do agree that the prediction, at least, is for solar cost reduction. We haven't actually seen that much recently, although there has been historically a lot of decline. Uh, as you may know, we have two very large silicon production companies that have located in TVA service territory, and we're uh, working with them to see how we go about uh, promoting more solar installations. TVA continues to look at solar as a part of our mix, but certainly not as a replacement or a competitor with something like nuclear or another large uh, sort of baseload duty cycle technology. So we see solar making uh, a contribution, and in the IRP it does make a contribution to the overall portfolio, but we don't see it uh, being a displacement for something like uh, a nuclear project, at least not in the near term anyway. Yes, um, my name is Amy, I'm with Public Facilities. Uh, just to follow up with Mr. Brinkworth, was it your scorecard that sort of addressed the cross-references of all of these investments, like mm -hmm. where the optimal um, electron volts and kilowatt hours would be um, most apt? And then there was also like securities. I don't know if you would um, to um, review that slide, but um, yes, I was just you on your um, process of cross-referencing, yes, um, so much in um, those visuals. This, my question was for Mr. Hill, sort of um, with the surfactants, when you're injecting some sort of like um, sulfur or a, a dioxin that's um, sensibly supposed to like pressure up, I guess you're um, trying to get uh, all of the um, sequestrated carbon, um, the optimal amount of, um, I guess, doping mechanisms for methane onto existing coal or residuals, um, whatever happens to be, I guess, the um, object of um, the mine's um, score. At any rate, um, I guess for like some of these pressure mechanisms, I was just wondering if, um, I guess, your method for um, encapsulation, I guess, like capturing the gases that you're planning on using for some of these turbines and motors, um, like how you were going about with um, some of the developments for those pressure systems to be um, 
I guess, expanded laterally or how the surface dimensions were qualified. I guess my question is kind of broad. I was just wondering if you were still conducting sort of like safety engineering prospects for how to, without using TNT per se, just to do like a surfactant mining that's just kind of, um, I guess, like geodesic or specific to some of these stents without, um, I guess, interfering much with the surface layer of whatever land is going on. So I guess I was just asking about your mining development procedures that seem like they're very non-invasive. And um, I guess if you would care to just address some of those mining engineering topics. Okay. Yes, I, uh, what I'll do, there, there are really two different areas we're working in. One is the uh, shallow, the shallower, we call them deep unmineable coal seams, but they're actually uh, generally just a, a th uh, several hundred meters deep or less. In that particular case where we're trying to store CO2 in uh, unmineable coal seams, it is in a gaseous form. So it moves down, it will move over, and it adsorbs to the coal. So it, it, it displaces the methane and we move the methane out. And we do, we're doing experiments to check that. And in, in the experiments, uh, so the first part of your question is we don't raise the pressure in those formations that much. Uh, these are formations that uh, uh, the, the, we, you have to get the CO2 close to the coal. So they, they, they don't move very far the, the, for, in the formation. But what we, we do these, what they call huff and puff. You put a little bit in, you draw it out. You see how much of the CO2 will come back with the methane. And you look at that ratio. So what's happening is it demonstrates the CO2 is staying there, preferentially adsorbed to the coal. The methane's coming out. So that, that part has been successful. And we'll monitor that over a long period of time as a risk assessment, as a safety factor, to make sure the, the CO2 stays there. It comes, yes, it comes in in truckloads uh, in compressed form, uh, and we inject it that way. Now, when we get into the saline formations, they're deeper. As I said, we try to stay below about 2,500 feet. We inject the CO2 uh, at a higher pressure so that it runs as what's called a supercritical fluid. It moves in. When we set up the wells, and the, these are go through an underground injection control, UIC permitting process. When we set that up, we have to do an MIT, mechanical integrity test. We test these wells, the cement that we put on the wells to put them in place so that they perform. And all that's done with a regulatory agency to assure that they work properly. And then you're limited in how much you can increase the pressure in the reservoir, and that keeps that allows it to keep that seal, that layer that you don't want to penetrate intact. So those two things are kind of safety factors to ensure the performance of the injection. Gary, uh, in looking at other utilities in the southeast, from what you know, do you think they will follow the same basic course in terms of the mix of coal uh, in the next 10 to 15 years that you've shown for TVA? We've reviewed several of the IRPs that have either been recently completed or that are at least ongoing where they've got documents we can look at from our peers around the southeast. It seems like everybody's kind of headed in the same direction of looking to back up a little bit from the uh, somewhat heavier reliance on coal that you've seen a lot of us with in the southeast. Uh, again, hedging against this carbon uh, legislation that we all expect is coming. Uh, and, and also just looking at the, at the economics of improvements in like renewables. We were just talking about solar and, and energy efficiency. So we think we're going to see that happening. Uh, I think TBA's uh, move may involve a little more nuclear than some folks because, again, we have some nuclear advantage in terms of sites that we want to develop, and we have this interest in small modular reactors. So that aspect may be a little bit different than some folks, but for the most part, I think we're all kind of headed in the same direction. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 
like to add a point. Um, we're watching this, and like I said, we're trying to make sure the uh, carbon capture technology is ready for the existing coal fleet so that those units won't be shut, shut down prematurely and new fleet. But obviously, because of the uncertainty, uh, companies are not moving aggressively toward coal. What, what we see in a lot of the companies is what I call a, the dash to gas. Uh, it only takes 18, 24 months to build a gas plant, combined cycle gas plant. If you're uncertain about coal, if you're uncertain about nuclear and, and how that's going to sort out or know it's going to take several years to get it off the ground, you move toward gas. And there's, you know, there's an, uh, unconventional gas supplies, reserves are going up, production are going up. Um, we're going to see it. Now, we saw the same cycle in the 80s, and it, it jumped, 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 and then fell flat. And so hopefully that kind of cycle will not occur again. But I think you can bet on it. In a lot of areas, there's going to be a quick move to build combined cycle gas plants to fill gaps while we try to figure out what's going on with coal and can we finance and build nuclear. Okay, hi. My name is Patty, and I work at Georgia Tech on smart grid technology. And this question is for Gary as well, I guess. Um, along with several other questioners, I'm curious, and I find it a little bit odd, actually, that TVA's proposed vision um, would include to be the leading nuclear expansion utility in the country, whatever it was, because um, I would think that the makeup of your energy mix wouldn't be part of the vision. I understand to improve air quality and renewable energy or to be sustainable or any of those things, but that's like a car manufacturing saying to be the leading Firestone tire, you know, adopter for our vehicles. It, it doesn't fit, and it, it makes me question the unbiased choices that are put in the in the scorecards that are out for public review and input supposedly, but yet it seems like a decision is already quite made. And from the, and I follow ener energy industry trade magazines very closely, and what I understand follows with what the lady over on the other side said, that um, basically across the country, Plant Vogel is the only nuclear expansion underway. The rest of the energy providers have determined that nuclear is not cost effective. So I was just wondering if you could address those thoughts. Sure. Well, I appreciate that perspective. It, it, a lot of our stakeholders share that perspective. You might imagine our board does not, uh, because that's part of the reason it's our vision. I, I would also point out that our project at Watts Bar 2 is actually also under development, so Vogel's not the only one. Uh, TVA has a long history of nuclear development. Uh, we've been involved in, uh, in nuclear power kind of research and development for a long time as part of our status as a federal agency. Uh, our board feels like uh, to position ourselves properly to continue to meet our mission in the Tennessee Valley, that nuclear has got to be an important part of our mix. Uh, at the same time, the board recognizes that the IRP is still an ongoing thing, and even though we've set the vision uh, and made some of those uh, uh, aspirational goal statements, we haven't locked into any commitments. Our, our current level of commitment in nuclear is only to continue uh, the Watts Bar 2 project that's currently under development right now. Uh, the IRP is actually helping to shape the board's decision about when and how much future nuclear is going to be part of our package. Uh, but I think the board's vision is intended to identify TVA's uh, philosophical direction, that we think nuclear is going to have to play a large role in our uh, resource mix going forward. And so we think we have to be in the forefront of evaluating and developing and encouraging that technology because we want to rely on it in the future to displace some of our coal projects uh, that we might otherwise continue to operate, kind of to Jerry's point, the uncertainty about capture and sequestration. W while we still encourage renewables and other things, everything has a place uh, at the table, we think. John, John Grinnell, Arnold Golden Gregory, a law firm, uh, uh, member of the Public Policy Committee for the Georgia Solar Energy Association. Um, what I'd like to know is, do you have cost projections on nuclear individually and your fleet in general, and I know you've got a whole bunch of assumptions and def different mixes, but do you have those projections? Uh, do you have them on the top of your head, and where could I get some? 
Okay. The answer is yes and no. Yes, we have cost projections. We have lots of cost projections. No, I don't have them on the top of my head. Uh, There's one other question. But, but they, are, yeah, they are part of the package. I think if you go to our website, our stakeholders, as you might imagine, have had very similar questions about our mix and our cost projections. We have a lot of information uh, already posted out there for, that, that's publicly accessible about our predictions in terms of cost and performance of, uh, of all the technologies that are in our mix right now. Uh, go and look in the website. If you don't see what you're looking for, my contact stuff is at the back of that presentation. Send me an email and we'll get you hooked up. Well, with that, I want to thank both of today's speakers and thank you for coming. And I hope we'll see you again in November for the next program in our series. Let's close by thanking both of our speakers.